Hi, in this video we're going to go over section 15.1, double integrals over rectangles. In this video we're going to talk about the theory behind double integrals and perhaps lead into the idea behind multiple integrals. So back to calc 1 or calc AB, we have an integral from A to B of f of x dx. And you learn that this definite integral represents the area underneath some function f from a to b. And we just want to briefly go over how that's developed from um, a Riemann sum. So in the Riemann sum, we can approximate this area as a height times a width. And one idea would be to use one giant rectangle for that region. And you soon discover like, well, what if we used multiple rectangles? And so that's what we start doing. We take multiple rectangles, they could be midpoint rectangles, they could be left-hand rectangles. They don't necessarily have to be the same width, but it's certainly easier for our formulas. And so we can approximate this area as a bunch of heights in the function at specific x values times some sort of width times some sort of change in x. This is height at some x value. And this is the width. And here, xi would be the points we're taking these with. Like here's x1, x2, x3. xi is just our notation to say, well, it's whatever for whichever one of these we want, but we don't want just one of them. This would be one rectangle. We want to add them up over the entire region from something like I equals one to N where it ends the number of rectangles. Now, how do we make this go from an approximation to the actual area? Well, like many things in Calc 1, we can get a better approximation, and in fact, an exact approximation by doing a limit, which means we'll use eventually infinitely many rectangles. So that won't change our sigma notation, add up all the rectangles from one to n. We'll still have our formula for these heights times the delta x. And we just come up with a better symbol for all this jazz by saying, okay, that's just going to be called an integral from A to B. And instead of saying F at some specific height, we're just going to use all the F heights. And instead of using a large width, we're saying DX as an infinitely small width. In 3D land, as you all are aware, we're going to have surfaces that live up here in 3D space. And we're gonna to wanna to find volume under this surface. We're gonna to try to find the volume under a surface instead of the area under the curve. And the way we're going to do this is just like we have to pick an X interval from A to B, we're going to pick a region. Now, we're going to start off in this section in particular by looking at, we're going to pick some rectangular region in the plane. I'm trying to keep things parallel to our axes. And I don't know if I'm doing the best job of that. And we're going to see how this projects up onto the region. So just because it's a rectangle in our xy plane doesn't mean it's going to be a perfectly straight shape 
or a perfect rectangular prism in 3D. There is a prismatic element to this space, those cross sections, to go back to another idea you may have had in Calc 2 or Calc AB. Um, the cross sections are all rectangular. And that means in general, we can use a formula for the volume. So in 3D, a volume for this kind of a prism shape is a surface area times a height. So we wanted to just use one big box, one big rectangle. If we want to just estimate it with one height, we could pick, you know, a corner. That's some um, F of, let's call it a B. And we could just overestimate if we did use a perfectly flat rectangle and use that one spot. And that would just be the height of a b f of a b times the area of this rectangle length times width and that would be one rectangular prism perfectly rectangular prism but we would know that would be a, a really weird estimate right it would go probably above the curve in some places maybe under the curve in some places it wouldn't be exactly a nice situation so instead we do exactly the same kind of thing we're going to start to subdivide our regions and we're going to subdivide them like this. We're going to add as many little tiny rectangles, little tiny delta X's and delta Y's and estimate heights maybe at the center of each of these rectangles. And we're going to do that and get lots of little tiny rectangular prisms at each of these spots. I know the drawing isn't ideal, but try to imagine what we're doing. And so we might want to do a better estimate instead of just one big rectangle would be picking each of those points. We're going to have different indices on those regions picking each of these points and multiplying by the area of each of these little tiny rectangles. And that would be the volume of one of those shapes. That would be the volume of one of those shapes, but we want to make sure we count across both the X and the Y. So I'm going to need to add up all the I's from one to N and then all the J's. And as you can see, we could have different numbers of lengths and widths. I guess I didn't do that in my picture, but here you go, right? There could be more divisions in the X direction or the Y direction than vice versa than the other dimension. So the process is we cut the area, the domain, into equal rectangles, containing special points, x, i, y, j, those special points. The key idea would be that, one more time, that would represent the area of each rectangle, of each sub rectangle. And this would be the height we're using height at x, i, y, j. And then we're adding up all of those heights along both the X and Y dimension. You could think of this as adding up along the X's, this as adding up along the Y's. How do we make this more accurate? Just the same exact trick, except now we need our volume to involve two limits. We're going to allow limit number one 
as M goes to infinity, and we want to take a limit number two as N goes to infinity of that expression. We want to add up infinitely many divisions across both the X and the Y in order to make sure we're capturing all of the data at as fine of a scale as we need. And this is why we'll have our notation volume, a volume underneath the surface is a double integral because we had two limits over the region R. We'll definitely use R when we're talking about rectangles, especially. And again, we're going to use every single point. And instead of using dx or dy, we'll use dA. Now, to be clear, dA is going to be composed, decomposed into dx, dy, or, and it might matter, dy, dx. Now, that makes things clear for a rectangle, or at least clear-ish. I also want to be clear that if you had some sort of weird region in 2D space, this will be more relevant in the second section, if in the XY plane you were trying to find the area above, let's say a common one is, you know, the parabola and a line, you know that that's not going to be an easy area to make. It's certainly not a rectangular shape. So that sh shape in XY plane would correspond to finding the area below some surface and above that region. So you'd still have your parabola, you'd still have your X line, X, Y line. And then we're talking about above this surface, sorry, above this point, we'd be talking about the volume of this space. Now, how can we decompose this into um, rectangles? Like why would a rectangular transformation still work? Well, it's because we can still subdivide this region into rectangles. Not perfect rectangles, but if I started doing boxes, trying to get data from each of these spaces, I would pretty much be able to cover the whole region with some sort of rectangle. And if I made these rectangles infinitely small, and I covered the whole region, so I can, you can see that I need to go more. If I covered the whole region with rectangles, as I started to make the region even smaller, each rectangle even smaller, I would get a better and better approximation. And so just like how we can use rectangles to do all sorts of weird curves in 2D, we can use um, rectangles still to do weird shapes in 3D, even rectangular prisms, I guess is what I meant. So that's it for the theory. I hope this gives you a picture of what's going on. The actual integration is going to be easier, just like the actual integration in Calc 1 is easier. But I'll see you in the next video to talk more about that.